All right, welcome back to Science Fiction and Fantasy Read Along. I am ATN. I'm DM Phil. And I'm Yule. In our last episode, Krupp dreamt of an elder god. There's a stalemate at Majesty Hall. Marilio teased out a pair of invitations to the fate, and Baruch has discovered the identity of the coin bearer. In this episode, we will be discussing chapter eight, which is the first chapter of the section entitled The Mission. That's book three of seven. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty excited that we're back with the bridge burners. Yeah, they're cool. It felt like that last book. We were, I mean, it was like we were starting all over with a whole new, it's the whole new series. We did. Yeah. yeah. And it's, yeah, it's a lot of work to introduce all those characters. And uh, I'm glad we can get back to somebody we know and recognize and love. Yeah. Cause everybody in Darugistan sucks. <laughs> There's a lot that I like there. We're just getting lazy, but yeah, this is going to be really cool when they all come together. I'm sure. Like a good fantasy novel. There must be a convergence. So something I did over the weekend is I read the back of the book, which is something you would do when you were, you know, perusing a book and deciding if you want to read it or not. And I kind of got this weird sensation about what this book was going to be like. Hard to explain, but nevertheless, like, I feel like the back of the book is really, really misleading. Like it's a story about the Empress and her her plans and stuff. And (laughs) I don't know what I expected from this book originally, but I know it wasn't this complicated mess. But I love this complicated mess. Why don't we get started, yeah? Let's go. Yeah. Book three starts off with a little little clip it from Sayings of the Fool by Thinny Buell. And it talks about marionettes. That's, I don't, I, that's pretty much all I got out of that. Please interpret that for me nope. because I don't get it. No. <laughs> at, this mo- at this point in time, I dare not. In, I in a very general sense, it talks about some entity gods or powerful people or circumstances essentially controlling events and people and this person dances around them and that's kind of all i got out of that i think that's a good interpretation of it isn't that what we're all kind of doing anyway i really don't know um when i looked at that one marionettes sure keyword there and we're dealing with somebody who is on strings like Herlock, right sure. and Something about a circle dance, but like that is a term I've never in my life heard. Well, it could it get it in any way be referencing um, Krupp. Why? I don't know. I, I, I'm just spitballing here. I mean, well, because, that's good to spitball, well, but at the same Krupp, time, why do you make that suggestion? Well, only right. because Krupp kind of hides in the shadows. He manipulates things. He keeps track of things. Um, it could be the high alchemist, Baruch, you know, because he does the same thing. People that manipulate others and manipulate events. But those are the mortals. It could mean gods also. Why do, the reason I say corrupt is because gods are always manipulating events, right? But corrupt can somehow see through that all the time, naturally. I don't know. I, I have no idea what it means. I don't know. I assume it's got something to do with a pawn because of the term fool that's in there, but I, I really don't know. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Sayings of the fool? There you go. I think you just said something. So, yes, it's it's a pawn who's manipulating events in the real world. The I in the poem. You mean the I as in I swear on Hood's grave? I shall not live as they do. Yeah, exactly. Who's that? A fool. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, all right. The end statement is we don't know what that means. At all. Usually at the end of the chapter, I can go back and make more sense of these things. And this is not one of those times. So help us out, folks. If you have any ideas, please let us know. It's possible that at the end of the book, being the mission, book three of seven in the novel, we might get some more inclination or ideas about what's going on at the end of the book. So we might have to revisit it. But what about the preamble? I think it's uh, specifically talking about Whiskey Jack. Oh, yeah. No, I I agree completely. It's called The Bridge Burners, and it's written by Talk the Younger. But I I agree completely. It's about Whiskey Jack. I never thought Talk was like a historian. Wasn't he with the claw or something? He is still with the claw. Well, he was there when, I'm assuming, (laughs) some stuff went down, or at least knows about the stuff that went down. If you will recall, when Talk the Younger escorted Gano's parent into the city of whatever the Pale. hell. Mm, was it Pale? Yeah. No, I thought it was that city up in the north. Pale. Maybe it was Pale. <laughs> yeah, it was Pale. <laughs> when he was escorting Perrin into the city of Pale, he gave him a lot of information about uh, Whiskey Jack and the bridge burners and all like the stuff that Perrin really shouldn't know. Perrin just happens to have picked that stuff up, right? But talk was pretty full of information. Bridge burners are pretty hot right now. 
looks like they're going to get disbanded, blah, blah, blah. What was this intro prologue poem about? Because you mentioned it. I oh, yeah. It um, it's, it's all about Whiskey Jack stepping down. It sounds like stepping down or being demoted as the emperor and his high fifth. Wait, the emperor and what? Yeah, his exactly. His first sword. Yeah. Killed. Yeah. And then Empress, Empress Lacine takes over and Whiskey Jack gets demoted. We know DJ steps up. So we had a long conversation in episode four where we were suggesting that maybe he stepped down on purpose. Mm -hmm. I think we'd speculated about multiple episodes. We'd, we'd, we'd asked the question in chapter three, and then we were asking the question again in chapter four, and we were pretty convinced that he had stepped down in order to avoid scrutiny and avoid being noticed by the gods, etc. But I think this is evidence that he was not actually doing this voluntarily, that he was stripped of his sigil. Right, so it says there, he stepped down and then he was stripped. It's kind of... It says that he stepped down three times. Right. Throughout the entirety. But he was definitely stripped by Lacine, probably around the time that the Emperor, Dancer, and Dasim were all killed. It also said that he, he chose to stick around instead of just stepping away. That was his choice. He, Instead of leaving in shame and retiring, to, whatever, whatever, he chose to stick around and he chose to do so as a constant reminder to Lacine of her, of her treachery. So sort of the opposite of going unnoticed. Yes. I, yes. He definitely I, wants to be a thorn in her side or a reminder. Yeah. That might be his motive, but that might be inferred by talk. I mean, talk doesn't actually know whiskey Jack. Mm -hmm. True. Well, either way, it might justify the, all the stuff that went down outside Pale, where they tried to destroy the bridge burners. I think it goes some way to explaining Lacine's motivations mm -hmm. for the order. Yeah, exactly. And you brought up something, ATN, where it talked about right here that uh, the lives of the Emperor and the First Sword were... Blood-soaked sand spilled the lives of Emperor and First Sword. Do you guys remember from the very beginning when they were in Itko Khan? So it was Dancer, his head assassin. Mm -hmm. yeah. It wasn't the first sword. The first sword was Dasim Ultor, unless he's got yet another name. No, I think there can be only one. It's like the Highlander. Right. So how mm. and when did the assassin die? I don't think that this inclusion of Dancer in this moment is to say anything about Dancer. I think it's more to include Dasim. All right, fair enough, but there's been no mention of Dasim Ultor since then. and Not in that context, but there's been more information about Dasim than either of the other two. Yeah, it's hard to keep track of this, everybody. Um, we try very hard. Make your own damn spreadsheet. That's right. <laughs> We're spending more time on this than I thought we would, but it's probably a good thing because it is a little bit confusing. But I have a question for you about towards the lower mm -hmm. third, there's a sentence that begins, a price was placed before him that he glanced over in first passing, unknowing and so unprepared and stepping down among women and men, he found what he'd surrendered and damned its reawakening. That was a very difficult passage for me, and I've gone back over it a few times since rereading this chapter. And I think I might understand it, but do either of you have anything that you would like to throw out there before I, I make my effort? I don't know what necessarily the price is, but the thing that he found, I think, is not the price. So I'm talking about the thing that he found is obviously his want to stick around, maybe, or his desire to make something happen. Okay. My thought was that what he, what he got, he was demoted to a sergeant. And that gave him maybe a little bit of humility. But either way, he found people looked to him. They respected him. He was a leader. And more than just a leader in rank, but a leader in, in the true sense that people followed him. I don't know. Something to that effect? Maybe like a, an assurance that what he's doing is right, that he has the backing of everybody, like you said, those well, people. Well, yeah. Well, I get the sense that if he went rogue and launched his own rebellion against the empress like people would follow him and he doesn't want to do that and that's why he says he damned its reawakening that sort of hero worship so what was the price was it um the fact that he has the loyalty of all those people is that what that is i th i think the two things are the same thing and after, after going ab about this in a few different ways, I, I've kind of landed on the conclusion that the word that we're looking for is compassion. Oh. If you read that whole thing with the idea that it's a single word that we're looking for, that the price itself is compassion, that he stepped down among men and women, having all, you know, been, the, been the high fist, essentially, been the head of an army, 
And when he steps down back among these people, that maybe he kind of has to pay this price where he has to start looking them as individuals again. That would be kind of painful for somebody who has sent a lot of people to their deaths and who is still in the military and still has to send people to their deaths. So that, that's kind of where I took it. Well, maybe because you can tell that he lives a little bit pained and haunted existence. Yeah, he grinds his teeth. I mean, he's not, he's not without stress. Anyway, it's for, it's for anyone else that wants to, to interpret. On the North Shore above Lake Azure... The bridge burners enact a change of plans. The last time we saw the bridge burners, they were about to leave Pale. It was like four in the morning and the Morant, the black Morant had just arrived and they were getting ready to take the bridge burners south to Darujistan. We are meeting up with them. I think it's about one exact day later and it's just this remote, huge redwood trees, uh, massive lake. It's pre-dawn, pebble beach. Makes me think of the Pacific Northwest. And here we find the bridge burners. Specifically, I think we find Kalam and a black moranth approaching Whiskey Jack. Kalam was saying that they got their munitions and that Fiddler and Hedge are happy sappers. Yes. That was a big deal. It is a big deal. So we deal. know they're around. <laughs> uh, Whiskey Jack wondered aloud, I guess, uh, suggesting that he thought that the munitions were getting scarce <laughs> yeah he did and that's when we have the first time i think we've heard a morant actually speak i think you're right he, he's very curious in the way that his speech pattern is and he refers to whiskey jack as bird that steals yes so maybe we can get into that also the interesting thing here is they said that the whiskey jack said hey are the munitions short and he responded selectively which means that, yeah, they're short for everybody else, but for you, we'll, we'll scrap up what you need. He said that they would never have shortage for them. Yeah, because they're well known, the bridge burners. Yeah, but so what, what is it? What is it about the bridge burners? I think they respect them. Right before that, he said, you tread the enemy's shadow. And I deliberated on that. Does he mean, is that specific or is that some sort of, I, I don't know, metaphor? I'm fairly sure that you can't really get closer to your enemy than being in its shadow. And that means something to the Moranth? You know how some people fetishize the Marines because they're the first in and the last out? I like to make good weapons for them. These are the Marines. These are the bridge burners. They're, they're the famous Marines. They're the ones that are sent in to do the dirty work every time. And I think that the Moranth appreciate these people. But, I mean, they've got to know that their lifespan is coming to an end. You know, there's only enough of them to fit in one boat. So, but Whiskey Jack responded. He was apparently surprised and he looked away and it said the skin tightened around his eyes. And do you think that was suspicion, confusion? Was he surprised just by the Moranth kind of like pledging their loyalty to them? Something like that. Because, yeah, this was the very first time any Moranth has ever spoken, period. Even when spoken to, they just do not respond back. Well, I do think that Whiskey Jack has spoken to Moranth in the past. He has because it's the very next line where the Moranth actually answers a question that Whiskey Jack made of them all the way back. And if you're in the trade paperback like we are, page 122. Yes, but I will also point out that that was literally one day ago. I know. For us, it's you know, many hours. <laughs> yeah, no, it's an entire book away. Exactly. And only now are we getting the answer that Whiskey Jack asked about a one-handed Moranth that was marked for valor. Five times. And he wanted to know if this gentleman or this Moranth still lived. And it's only now where this black Moranth says, a warrior without one arm, he still lives. And I think that's pretty interesting. He gives us a little more information about how they knew each other too, right? That they fought together in the streets of Nathalog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was pretty neat. And um, why do you think he waited an entire day to mention this? Maybe they had to get back. Maybe it's like some sort of hive mind. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I thought he talked to a green Moranth at the time, and this is a black Moranth. No, it is a black. They were both black. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not sure if it's the same one or not either. No, it's hard to say, right? Because no, there's nothing to set them apart or distinguish mm -hmm. them. Um, but it, I mean, it's obvious that he heard the question because he's answering the question. Mm -hmm. Whiskey Jack kind of asks the Morant for a favor. He says, theoretically speaking, could you have a random patrol come in this area in about two weeks? So what's that called? A favor. No, that's an extraction. I didn't know what it meant. He's setting up an extraction. 
No. Oh, okay. I have no idea what he's setting up. I honestly do not. He's saying, uh, uh, be here in I two weeks. So if, if everything goes poorly, we can meet you here and get out. And he didn't respond directly. He, he didn't say, yes, I'll be here. He said, we occasionally do stuff like that. As a matter of fact, I may be doing some random patrol in two weeks. But he doesn't give a specific affirmative. He's just like nebulous. He is nebulous. In fact, Whiskey Jack's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know what to get from that. Well, what does he get from it? Well, he gets more conversation with the Maranth, where he's like, we're not so unlike you and I. Further connecting the Maranth, or at least the Black Maranth, and the bridge burners like kind of like a show of respect. He does, but it's like he's changing subject at the time. And he said, we are not so unlike. In our eyes, deeds have measure. We judge. We act upon our judgments. As in pale, we match spirit with spirit. Well, we thought that they just went in and callously butchered people in pale, right? For like an hour straight. Oh, they did. Well, they did, but I mean, it's much more, I guess, spiritual. <laughs> it was refined as well. Well, everything you'd heard about the Moranth up to date was that they were kind of like people were kind of disgusted with their behavior at acting as if they went into pale and just killed every single person they possibly could get their hands on as in for one hour like genocide for one hour but that's not what they did well it is sort of what they did but they had a very specific number in mind what was it like one for each person it was for all the Moranth that had suffered and died at the hands of people from pale and it was specific 18,739 souls departed in the purge of pale one for each Moranth confirmed as a victim of pale's history of enmity toward us and that's honorable that is justice that is like perfect i don't know how they figured that out or how they you know didn't kill one more but that level of honor and decency and dignity and <laughs> revenge revenge yes i don't know also. if honor and decency and revenge go together oh i think it does ah, sure maybe. is it revenge or is it and i hate to say this reparations well it's definitely tit for tat <laughs> Well, it wasn't two for one, right? It, sacking the city was not enough. They were very specific. They were surgical and they were precise. And I think that's pretty awesome. And it's a complete flip around on the portrayal that uh, people have of the Black Moranth up until this point. Oh, totally. I mean, it, it did that for me. I mean, I thought that their agreement was pretty disgusting and I still don't like it. But at the same time, hearing their explanation in just a casual sentence is, mm, it, it makes it make more sense. Right. They no longer seem like monsters. Part of that is aided by the fact that he is speaking, whereas before they have not been talkative at all, right? They just show up. They kind of, mm hmm, mm hmm. They completely ignored Whiskey Jack the last time he tried to talk to them. And it's like, it's really hard to gauge a creature or a person based on that kind of behavior when you know they understand him and they don't even respond to him. Yeah, even when Perrin was getting taught about the quarrel and getting flown around and stuff. It was some other dude that was talking to him. Was it a Maranth? I don't believe so. It was the guy from the city that I was thinking of in the north, right? Yeah, it was the Claw and Genabacus. Genabacus, thank you. Okay, so Whiskey Jack has sent Kalam to go fetch the wizard and to get everybody together because he, he wants to explain the plan to the bridge burners. And the plan is changing. Yeah, because Whiskey Jack has deemed that the Empress's plan is just there to get, get them killed. It was specifically designed to do so, yeah. <laughs> he makes his arrangements for the extraction point that Philip was talking about with the Moranth, and then the Moranth departs. But before the Moranth departs, he observes to Whiskey Jack that there is a rot within the Empire, and that it's a rot that's not yet fatal. It's common to all empires but it needs to be scoured out and that the Moranth are extremely good at this kind of work. Why would he tell Whiskey Jack that information? I have no idea. It's like he's offering a service, you know, it's like an advertisement. Hey, we will kill bugs in your home. You know, we're exterminators. We'll come over, we'll wipe them out. You'll live bug free. And he's telling Whiskey Jack this. Yeah. He's a sergeant. And they obviously don't trust <laughs> the Empress. Let's go back to the question that I asked earlier about why the Moranth waited for an entire day to answer Whiskey Jack. He's offering him this amazing service that like you have treachery, treasonous people within your ranks. Well, here's my theory. When Whiskey Jack asked about the Moranth before, like, oh, I used to know a one-armed guy, that was in Pale, and there were lots of other people standing in that area. Yeah, they were on a rooftop with Dujek one-arm, Fiddler, Whiskey Jack, who knows who else was there. Right. 
but this is maybe the first chance that the Morath has had to have Whiskey Jack alone or semi alone. Yeah, Kalam was there, I think, when he told him the uh, the information about. Oh, was he there when he made this offer? Whiskey Jack was alone. No, nope, nope. Whiskey Jack was alone because yeah. Kalam saluted and left before that. This was a private offer. This to Whiskey Jack. I mean, there's two things that he's told him. One is the offer for cleansing, right? Which he told Whiskey Jack in private. But did he tell Whiskey Jack about the one armed Moranth in front of Kalam? Yes. So they must be holding on tight to their information is my guess. They, they're they suspicious of something that maybe we just aren't aware of. All right. So we know there's a change of plans. We know that the offer has been made to Whiskey Jack and not the Empress, which is probably the person that you know should be getting the offer. Anyway, so Kalam returns with the bridge burners after the Morantha's has left. Whiskey Jack's kind of like off in his own little world. I don't know thinking about things, probably the gravity of what he was just told by the Moranth, for one thing. And he tells the bridge burners when he comes to that they're scrapping the plan because of what Yule said, that it was designed to get them killed. And he doesn't like that. He wants to live. So he divides them into two teams. And their job is to get into Darujistan without being noticed. They have a local fishing boat that the green Moranth dropped off. And then he asked, does anyone know how to fish? Sorry, does. Back when she was a fisher girl. She's like, I remember fishing a long time ago. She's on the not boat side, right? I'm sorry? Was it, when he's taking the two teams, he's all, Kalam will lead one. And with him will be Quick Ben and Sorry. Yeah, the division of labor is not for now. It's for... I for see. Understand. I thought they were entering... See, that's... Sometimes I don't get it. <laughs> I, but, think, I thought they were entering different ways. Okay, so we've got everybody together now except for Quick Ben, who's still off. We don't know where he is. And then we cut and leave this scene. And in that absence, the plan is explained to the bridge burners. Yes, but I think the important part is when they asked, does anybody know how to fish? And Sari said yes. You know how she's been like possessed by Dancer or Cotillion, same That's, thing? So the rumor goes. Like, Sari is still in there, right? Her personality is still there. And I don't know if it's bleeding out through – the subconscious or they're becoming integrated and becoming one and it's getting hard to tell the difference. I don't know. The point is that was sorry that answered. Cotillion can access her memories for sure. He, he can either read her memories or she's answering in turn, but I don't know that we can really mm -hmm. tell which one's which. I, I see your point, but I, there's something that's coming up later on that I think might further inform us. Fair enough. But the point is sorry is still in there. Oh yeah. I believe that. Do you think we're trying to make sorry more than she is because I, I don't know sometimes i think he's writing her so that we feel this way and sometimes i think maybe we're just making it this way ourselves and what that is is making sorry a sympathetic character when she's just a stone cold killer being controlled by these people when tattersale was doing one of her readings from the deck of dragons she described the card that was the virgin of high house death and the description is of the, the girl is blindfolded and the blindfold is wet, which I interpret that to be tears. So the possession, we know she's possessed. She does not control her body. If she's got a blindfold on, I take that to mean she's, she's not the driver. She's not steering that ship. And if there are tears involved, that means it's really against her will. But it also implies to me that she's still there, just like Philip says. Mm -hmm. She's still in there. Um, but she has no control. It makes me think of Twin Peaks, right? Of, of um, Laura Palmer's dad. He was in the back seat watching Spoilers. it all happen. He had no control over what was going on. And I think that's pretty much what we've got here with Sari. Chug a lug, Donna. <laughs> Those are my feelings. I hope nobody's. Oh, man, I was just going to watch Twin Peaks next. <laughs> if, yeah. if anybody's bothered by me spoiling Twin Peaks for them, <laughs> get over it. <laughs> All right, so one last thing before we move on to the next chapter, and that is the Moranth part. refers to Whiskey Jack as bird that steals. Oh, yeah. He does it three times, two or three times. He doesn't call him Whiskey Jack. He calls him bird that steals. So I just typed in Whiskey Jack in Google, and it comes up with this funny little bird known as the Canadian Jay, which Philip and I have encountered up in Washington State before when we were just standing around in a parking lot of a ski resort trying to eat chips and this bird would fly up and steal the chips out of our hands before we could get them in our mouth <laughs> it was ridiculous i mean it's like thieves with wings it was unbelievable that is what a bird that steals is 
It's Are you a, kidding me? No, it's the common name for the Canadian J. Oh and it's Whiskey God. Jack. <laughs> okay, I that's have, cool. I have no idea how AT and put all that together, but that's really cool. I told you, I typed I typed Whiskey Jack into Google because I was like, this has to be something. And it's Canadian, which uh, Erickson is. Yes. All right, that's cool. I never knew, but I kind of just assumed that it was just something that a person gets, you know, as a uh, as a name sometimes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Put sure. two things together. You, I don't. You know. are an honorary Moranth. You are a bird that steals. Yeah. Weird. Quick Ben and Hairlock meet within the Warren of Chaos. Okay, so Quick Ben's been in the forest while all of this stuff has been going on with Whiskey Jack and the Moranth and the Bridge Burners and the plan being explained. And he's out in the forest setting up these like sticks in the ground and then tying a noose around one of them and sticking the rest of the strings around the other pieces. And he, he's working some magic and it, it all has to do with Hairlock. And he says his name, Hairlock, Hairlock. And then he himself... I fi maybe physically, I don't really know. But anyway, he ends up in the Warren of Chaos, traveling downward at quite a clip until he arrives on the Spar of Andy, which is the midway point in the Warren of Chaos. And thereby he knows how deep Hairlock has explored because they have to meet in the middle. And by that, it means they, equal, they travel equidistance. And since they met in the middle of the Warren, he came from the top, Hairlock came from the very bottom or the foot. So Hairlock has explored the entirety of the Warren of Chaos. And when Hairlock shows up, his clothes are all singed. His, the wood of him as a marionette is singed. And his eyes are a flicker with chaotic energy. They talk about him like leaning over the edge of the Warren and actually looking over it or something like that. Yeah. How did you picture this Warren? I don't know. I, I, I just kind of like Abyssal or something like that, maybe. Abyssal is reasonable. He called it the Caverns of Chaos. And I think this is important and be because I'm a nerd. Do you remember how Erickson used to play, like, fantasy role-playing games? So there's this iconic, like, fantasy role-playing game module called the Caves of Chaos. And here we are. Yeah, I know, right? And, and it's a Dungeons & Dragons thing, not like GURPS, that, which he used to play. But, you know, there's no reason why they couldn't cross. The point is, this was this iconic adventure that everybody liked, and it was in... There's like five editions of Dungeons and Dragons and it was in four of the five and they just redid it over and over. I played it. It showed up in some, in some form in every edition except third edition. I don't know what you think chaos looks like, but I don't pic picture it as caverns and I don't know, maybe it's an homage. I played that module. It's one of the funnest things I've ever done. And when I read Caves of Chaos, I'm like, that's so cool. And did it have anything to do with large open caves? No, pretty much nothing at all. It was just uh, the similar name. <laughs> good, good story bro it's crazy why would he do that i don't know but I, you know whatever i got excited about it and i think that's cool and maybe he did it that way maybe he didn't i mean it's an iconic thing so it's very possible well okay so to answer yule what how did you picture this place i don't know i, I he called it caverns that and then a series of caverns stacked vertically upon one another yeah, he did. And there's like yellow, smoky clouds. Yes, but he also talked about at the spar, it was the like spar is black like... rock and it was swirling a little bit. And where the rock was breaking, you could see red. So I kind of picture that as like magma or something. You know how like when you watch like basalt flows on Hawaii, it'll, it'll like, it'll be black rock, but it'll separate as it's flowing. Sure. And you'll see the magma beneath. I don't know. That's kind of how I pictured it. Yeah, and, and at least in the very middle here, there's something solid for them to stand on. But yeah, vast open caves, huge expanses, yellowish air. Seems like there might be some light going on, but I'm not real sure or clear on it. Yeah, you'll got it right. It sounds kind of abyssal and hellish. And at the midway point, there's this spar of rock jutting out of the mists, I suppose. And upon the tip of it sits Hairlock. During his traverse of this warren to this place, he realized that Herlock has gone quite a ways. And he thinks to himself that Herlock might have gone too far. Or maybe he's losing control. And then he sees the guy and he's all scorched. And he's like, oh, yeah, this guy's definitely, he's definitely playing with stuff he can't handle. But um, Herlock assures him that, oh, no, I will master this power. Don't worry. But he's there. He's talking about the power at the root or the foot of the warren being like all of that creation. And like, I'm wondering, what would he try to create? What would Her What's Herlock doing in there? 
because he's obviously gaining power from being in there. But like, what is he after? What's he want inside this Warren, which is a horrible place. Let's be honest. I don't know, man. What would he, what would he want? I mean, here he is. He's a puppet, right? I assume he has to want revenge. He was the ace in the hole, right? Yes. You know, this was the deal. That's right. And I guess going and collecting as much power as you can for whatever situation you're going to get yourself into. He's already been getting hounded by hounds. Hilarious. <laughs> And uh, he, he, he wasn't the one to stop the hound gear. That's true, but that could have gone so many different ways. It could have. Well, I mean, he was using his magic, but... He was using this magic. That was chaos magic he was using, right. which he's, he's learned how to use since he's been in here. I don't know if he wants a new body or something, but do you remember when Baruch was evaluating Animator Rick? He's like, this guy has been playing with chaos for 100,000 years. And it hasn't changed him. And he said, power like that always changes you, right? It changes the user. Herlock is here, and he's playing with chaos, right? And it is affecting and him. And it's affecting him. Yeah. In and out. Yeah. But or you asked his motivation? In. I don't know. <laughs> There's some indications that we've been getting, little hints that Steven Erickson likes to drop that lets us know that everybody around Herlock thinks he's going crazy. Oh, yeah. It's definitely mentioned. Right, so it may be that he's in a puppet's body and not his own body. That may be part of it, but it also may be part of the fact that he's been spending a lot of time in here, and he does not have the will and the resolve and the power to thwart the effects of the Warren like Anamander Rake does. I'd say that's a very reasonable assessment, Philip. And Quick Ben also. Well, Quick Ben doesn't love to spend time in here. No, but he's been this far before. He has. He well, how do you know that? Well, he says it. What does he tell Harlock though? Because he's trying to convince Harlock that it's not a great idea to stick around here. I don't remember what he says specifically to that. He point. warns him about the creatures that live here. Oh, that's right. And he said, they dislike intruders. I'm bound to you, wizard. The responsibility is yours. Nor will I hide the fact if I am taken. Ooh. Yeah, well, full of threats, this guy's always threatening. And it's there that right afterwards where Quick Ben's like, hey, you know, you are bound. We're bound to each other. And he's like, I want you to remember that, you know, so you're kind of losing it here. When warning Herlock about the native creatures or letting, reminding him, it's like, have you seen these things? Did that guy, did that ring any bells to you guys about the Imperial Warren? Yeah, there was a, uh, was it, it was like all dusty and there were like things out there that, that scratched the, scratched the walls or something like that. We had encountered um, like broken chain mail. And if you recall, Topper was really kind of cagey about the denizens of that realm. And so now I'm starting to wonder if this isn't a similar kind of deal where the wizardry of the Empire carved out their warren from an existing ancient warren that's no longer in use but still has denizens. Is it a warren of power or just for travel, that Imperial one? I think it can be used for, I mean, I think they're all both. Depends on how you use it. I just don't know. Okay. I mean, I, we don't have enough information to answer that question yet, for sure. Yeah, it's going to get confusing in the future. Yay! <laughs> the whole purpose of this meeting between Herlock and Quickbin is for Herlock to be debriefed. It so is what's, the, what, what, is, what does he tell Quickbin? He's talking about the fight that they had with Gear and how Tattersail is recuperating. I left you guys alone 24 hours ago, and in that time, you've been tracked down and attacked by one of the Hounds of Shadow. Tattersail's almost been killed. Perrin and his crazy sword. His very mundane sword is what, or a mortal weapon is all they say. It's a mortal weapon. I think he does call it a mundane weapon once and a mortal weapon the other time. He said, he said, I did. He said, a mortal weapon. It shouldn't have been possible. Yeah, and that is referring to the mortal weapon that pierced gear and almost killed it. Yes. And that was with Opon's aid? Okay, that so let's talk about that. We know from the debrief that Hairlock is now very well aware that deities are involved in the game that the bridge burners are playing, or at least that they're involved in, right? Herlock knows this. He states it overtly that like, wizard, you were keeping information from me. There are deities involved. You think that they couldn't wrest control of me from you, possibly even use me against you? And he pulls out his little knife, his little scalpel, and he starts menacingly walking towards Quickben. And Quickben's like, huh, I didn't know. Maybe, ooh, maybe you should have told him. But this means that Herlock doesn't know that Opon is involved. 
he knows something because in a fever that was breaking, Tattersail screen, or mentions the coin. Yeah, but he doesn't yeah. know about the coin either. He's like, what's this coin? Well, he now knows to know that he should know something. <laughs> It seems like he should t trust that that's real information, maybe, but he doesn't seem to. But then again, he is a crazy person at this point. He's unaware of the coin's existence. We talked last time about the possibility that maybe the coin is a known artifact. Well, it's not known to Harlock. And Tattersail basically told him that the coin had spun, the coin had fallen, the coin had been picked up and was now born by someone. And none of that rang any bells to Harlock. Back in chapter four, when Gear attacked Tattersail and Perrin, you know, all the stabbings and the dog fleeing and et cetera, et cetera. When he at like, how did your sword get through those defenses? Perrin said, lucky, I guess. And Hairlock cursed the twins. He said, Opon, Hood's curse upon the twins. And Philip was like, obviously he knows Opon's involved. And it's like, yeah, it's pretty obvious. But it's got it, – it can't be because he right now he doesn't know. Unless, like you said, he's going insane and he is you know, forgetting things. I'm maybe. wondering if he's not just really cavalier about his curses like everybody else. Well, and there's been a time when someone said something about curses like that. You know, shh, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it makes Tattersail nervous because, as you remember, she's fully aware that Opon is listening. Opon is paying attention to these kinds of things. But it doesn't seem like Harlock is privy to that information, and he doesn't seem to know anything about the coin. When Perrin said that it was luck, that seemed to have been the trigger for Harlock getting mad at the twins. Nevertheless, I don't think he's really aware of Opon's actual presence, because he later on asks, who is the deity that's involved with this stupid mortal? And he even calls him a fool. Huh. He calls him a foolish mortal. So, so like, the answer is there for him to just pay attention to. Yeah. He's doing every I've talked about the coin. Yeah. I've cursed upon. Yeah. I've called this guy a fool. I know this sword shouldn't work, etc. It's all these things that would say, hey, pay attention to this. Yeah. He even knows that there is gods involved or right. ascendants involved or whatever it is. Um, he just can't for some reason is overlooking the most obvious thing. And that may be because he's now insane. Or there's something at work to prevent him from noticing also. Remember that Tayshrin was blocked by Opon. Hairlock may be being blocked by Opon as well. We don't know. Yeah, but Tayshrin did have that one part where he's like, talk to me about the spinning coin. <laughs> I, I got it. We got All this. Right. Philip, right. do you remember at the end of chapter four, you were like, who is it that's whispering in her ear? Tell me about the spinning coin. Yeah. It's Tayshrin. Tayshrin was asking. He got there too late. Hairlock's kind of crazy he's like talking out loud and quick ben realizes that he's he's insane and he doesn't realize that he's speaking out loud and he's getting glimpses into the puppet's mind actual mind hairlock's real mind and he's like it should have killed her she's too strong she's stronger than i thought he was hoping that that dog gear would kill tattersail probably from revenge not really sure but he underestimated her strength but he continues and says that she got knocked unconscious Tayshrin arrived, but she had sunk into unconsciousness and couldn't be questioned. And we know that Tayshrin knows about the spinning coin. Because he's heard it. What do you think? Yes. Ooh. Well, you brought up something. Yeah, I think, I think Herlock intentionally led gear to Tattersail. Oh, I think so too at this point, yeah. Because he went there, he fled there, then he hid in a box. And refused to help her. And she was like, Herlock, get out and help me. Well, she, she was doing that mentally. She was like, please help me. She, did, she didn't say it out loud. Well, the only reason she didn't die was because of Perrin Gnose. That's the only reason. And Harlock even came and said that. He's like, Gear should have killed her. Would have, if not for that idiot captain. Well, so I think you, you mentioned it, and I think you're right. I think Harlock intentionally brought Gear to Tattersail and to, to kill her. Right. And right now, back in Pale, we've got Perrin kind of playing nursemaid to Tattersail. And every time Harlock comes into the room, he draw, you know, he's got his hand on a sword. And he's like, I guess he knows that I would kill her if I could. Yeah, he pretty much admits it. He also says that Tayshrin will kill her, most likely, if he gets the opportunity. But he wants to question her first. I think we're onto the right track. But did you also notice that he underestimated Tattersail's strength? Fiddler underestimated her. 
Tayshrin's underestimated her. Everybody but Whiskey Jack has underestimated her so far. Even, well, no, even her. She's underestimated herself, but she survived Gear's attack. Like her defenses were strong enough. She did get help, though. And I'm glad. I'm glad. Well, okay, no. well, Quickman is concerned that he doesn't have as much control over Hairlock as he thinks he does. He said he felt the strings growing ever more taut. And then he said he, he knew what he'd have to do. And I'm like, well, what's that? Kill him? Let him go? What? Well, don't forget that he kicked him. He punted. He punted him, and he did it when he was still, when Hairlock was still kind of reminiscing about things. Quick Ben kind of stated that he hoped that the kick would have jarred him into forgetting what he had just told him. Anyway, he punted him off the edge and was like, pursue Tatron's plans. And Hairlock's cussing at him and like, I'll get this son of a man. Vitriol and vile. And then Quick Ben realizes what he's going to have to do. In the very end of that, it says he was thinking about everything that Herlock had just told him. And he said, and the word remained, Gear. And with that name, the wizard Terra found a face. I wonder if he's seen Gear before. Let's answer the first question that Philip had first. Or let's try to. Let's, let's do it in, in order of operations, right? So the question is, well, what does he say exactly? Well, he said at the bottom the, of 194, he says, the wizard knew what he'd have to do. Hairlock had given it to him, in fact. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what has Hairlock given to him? That's how I would approach this. It's like, yeah, obviously we need to figure this out, but like, what did Hairlock give him that he didn't already have? Well, knowledge of what was happening. Obviously, it's just information, but he gave him several pieces of information. Well, gear was involved. Uh, Tattersall was hurt. The sword that Gnose had. Ding, ding, was ding, 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 ding. Mundane, but not. Of all the things that he learned there, not very many. Really, that Tattersail was hurt, not important at all. As far as like something that he can use, doesn't matter. Gear's involvement, possible, definitely possible. The fact that a mundane sword broke through Gear's defenses, that seems very important to me. Well, it also implies that Gano's parent is very, very important. And that's not something they knew before. I, I think they were running from the guy, right? They did not want him to be on that mission. They, they definitely knew he was there and they left. No, wait, he was hurt. They left Tattersail to tend to him, and she wasn't happy about it. In the irony, he's now tending to Tattersail. Um, yeah, he was wounded. They didn't run away from him. Right. Um, they had no idea of his importance. They just knew that he was a, a servant of Lorne, but he wasn't Claw, and he was their new captain. And then he was killed, but not killed, and they, didn't, they couldn't explain it. Something healed him, and they didn't know what or whom. And it hadn't done a very careful job. It hadn't cared about his mental state. Right. It had just brutally healed him. Well, did they know he was a servant of Lorne? Yes, absolutely. How do you know? Because Whiskey Jack and Dujek or Whiskey Jack and Fiddler discussed it on the roof before they took off. Oh, okay. All right. So what else does he know? Herlock is fixating on the Warren of Chaos and saying that, you know, he'll master it. I don't know if that's new, but that's the magnitude of Herlock's emphasis on trying to master the Warren of Chaos is, is new because he's hanging out here. So much has happened in 24 hours. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. I, I don't know if he said he knew what he'd have to do about all the information he got or he knew he'd have to do about the Herlock because the, the paragraph before that said the strings he uses to hold them are getting very taut. And then he went into he knew what he'd have to do. So it, to me, it implies that he'd have to do something about Herlock. I don't know. Do you remember what Quick Ben's M.O. is? No, I don't remember, actually. Get enemies to destroy their other by destroying them from within? Sort of. It's make a deal with somebody nastier than your enemy and then hope that you're quick enough to get away. No, oh, oh, yeah, Quick Ben. Quick Ben. Is that something that's been stated before? Yeah. Yeah, Whiskey Jack reminded him that it got all of his compatriots killed. I remember now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> The new plan explained the bridge burners embark. Yeah, those poor guys. So in our absence, while we were hanging out with Quick Ben, Whiskey Jack has explained his plan to the bridge burners, to everybody except for Quick Ben, who we were just with. Sorry is the only person that's looking at him with like glee in her eyes. She likes this new plan, and Whiskey Jack's wondering who is actually staring back at him behind her eyes? He even like is damning basically uh, Whiskey Jack and Kalam for Quick their ben. ideas actually seeping into his head right now. Is Quick Ben and Kalam? Quick Ben and Kalam. Yep. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause they're trying to feed him that idea that she's possessed and she, you know, he, he's never bought it all along, but now he's starting to, obviously she likes the new plan. The, bri- the rest of the bridge burners are kind of pensive. They're thinking about what's going on. I think that they understand that, you know, it's dangerous what they're about to do. And as quick Ben is returning, they're all dismissed to go load the boat. Whiskey Jack, quick Ben and Kalam confer. Quick Ben says something. You are going to hate this idea that I've had. And then we miss 10 minutes of time while he explains it and we just don't get to witness it. And in that 10 minutes, a whole bunch of stuff's been going on down at the beach. Well, this is the part where it's suggested that the bridge burners don't know anything about rowing. That's where he says, he's like, I doubt anybody here can row their way out of a bathtub and we're about to cross a lake damn near as big as a sea. And uh, since when does a girl know anything about fishing? I don't know. Point is, they are soldiers, not sailors. And this, I mean, I like me, I cannot imagine getting across 600 miles or wh- however many miles. It doesn't matter. It's a long way. It's a long way. They said that Darujistan appeared as a faint glow on the opposite shore. Who so, knows what that means? 100 miles, 50 miles. If it was 10 miles, that's a long way to row if you're not a sailor and don't, and don't know how to maneuver a boat. I think it's crazy. I wouldn't try it. It scares the crap out of me. Well, they're, they're Marines. They're going to do it. But Sari knows how to, how to run a boat. She knows how to fish. They were given this boat with nets, so they're going to do some fishing on the way there. She's in charge of that. Whiskey Jack said, and he said, can you rig us a sail? And, he, and Sari says, there's no wind. He's like, well, maybe there will be. Yes, we have some canvas. We need a mast. And he just says, well, make it so, is essentially what he says. Th- that's not really the point. They're playing a joke on Trots right now, and everybody's laughing at it. But when Whiskey get, Jack gets there, he doesn't think it's funny. What's the joke? When Whiskey Jack shows up, it's Trots sitting here trying to pull an entire loaded boat, plus, well, boat plus everything in it, and pull it to the water. And he's not making any progress, and he just keeps struggling at it. I don't know why, but he does. Because he's not very bright. Right. The big oaf. Yeah, he's, um, he's bargassed. Mm-hmm. Size-wise, they're like halfway between ogres and humans. Probably like half orcs or orcs. They're that size. Do you think that's a bargas thing? A bargas thing that they're not so so sharp. Oh, I have no idea. I just I just assumed he'd been hit in the head too many times. But we know yeah, you he's know, not, Marines, we know he's not right? that sharp. And that goes all the way back to the card game where he deliberates for like a long time while they're playing, and he always chooses the exact same game every time. But he thinks about it really hard. <laughs> So Whiskey Jack is frustrated and he's like, Trots, get in the boat. The rest of you here? <laughs> he's like, get in the boat. Make yourself comfortable. Relax. The rest of you, get that boat in the water. Well, it's, it's 36 feet from the shoreline. Like it was, I think that was the specific figure. I mean, it's like many meters from the water's edge and he's sitting there trying to drag the boat. And somebody had the great idea of filling it and then playing this joke on him. And I don't know, like it wasn't sorry. Couldn't have been. Well, the thing is, the one thing I'll say is that Kalam is like, he says earlier, load up the boat and get it ready. And so at the end of this chapter, Kalam and Quickman are smiling. Yeah. But it's Whiskey Jack that says, hey, what are you doing standing here? Get to work. And then they have to go to work. So maybe it was Kalam was involved in all the all along. Is what I'm maybe, saying. maybe. I know that they, they are punished along with everybody else for you know except for trots trots gets to, trots gets to stretch out fill the whole boat basically with his whole body okay so funny funny joke and we're back with the bridge burners and that does it for the chapter it's a really short chapter pretty much just a little comedy at the end it seems meaningless but it's humorous entertaining it definitely lets us know that we are to expect that trots is a very very physically strong character yeah and I mean, dumb as a even if they are, yeah, and dumb as a rock yeah <laughs> those marines i'm real happy to be back with the bridge burners i liked them all all along and i'm happy to be back with them um let's see and i can't wait to get to the next chapter so now that we've read that does anything from the pre either of the preambles make more sense to either of you no no okay me either uh, no um Oh, it does end on Whiskey Jack, and we were saying that the first poem, or the, the chapter eight poem. The second preamble. Yeah, it was about him. Yes. And this whole last part. In fact, with the exception of the quick bend part, it's all about Whiskey Jack, this whole chapter. Huh. 
I mean, I hadn't really thought about it, but okay. I don't know. Maybe somewhere, if I looked a little deeper into what we're seeing, maybe that's exactly what we're getting from just this poem. I like the fact that it's amazing that we've had an entire book within this book when we were featuring Darujistan. We don't see the bridge burners, obviously. Not at all. In in the part 122, page 122, we have a question that's asked, and it's not until this chapter that we get the answer again, again, you know, to reiterate. And Ooh. that's the part where Whiskey Jack wants to know about the one-armed Moranth, and then yes. gets the answer. I, uh, <laughs> we, we have all this time to digest what happened in the first book within this, the pale. And then we have all of the second book, Darujistan, to just mull over everything. And, it, and then we get right back into it a day later. And I find that uh, an interesting way to tell the story. I like that the timeline works like that because you don't feel like you're missing out on a lot of information. You know, you don't feel like a whole bunch of the story's happening without you, but at the same time, you can still miss that fact and mm -hmm. still feel like you're missing out on a bunch of stuff if you because it is a, it is 3 or 4 chapters later that you get the information that lets you know that only 24 hours have passed and it's not overtly stated, you have to actually go back and look. Okay, they're getting on the corals at 4 in the morning essentially. You know, just at dusk, they're landing here and getting situated before dusk, and they rode through the night. That's how we're. That's how we find out that information. What I find interesting, uh, the way he writes this book, is that it is very linear, <laughs> except yeah. he does things to make it not linear at all. Like sure, in the second chapter, we discussed it in order as how it actually happens. You're referring to Tattersail, the Tattersail chapter, yes. Yeah, where we fought, we go back in time within that chapter to see the battle that took place when Tashrin's blowing everybody up basically right and then we go back into present time with the with, with the bridge burners meeting up with her and even in this it is linear because we have all of Darujistan occurring right at the same time or as this is happening and then we get back into book 3 with the mission and it's it's still linear, but in its own way, it's breaking everything up and almost making it like it isn't. I think uh, if you're not ready for that type of thing when reading this book, that's a lot where uh, people can find a lot of struggle. I think. I think that's true. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, you could draw you could draw out a timeline, you know, and then you could put stuff on the timeline, and it is all going along linearly. The fact that it's the fact that we're not receiving the information necessarily in chronological order. Does right. not detract from the story at all. Sure thing. Uh, and <laughs> uh, it's interesting because he'll do that in the second and third book where they're happening at the same time. And if you are really doing this whole story chronologically, I've seen the chart where you just read the prologue of Gardens of the Moon and then you read Esselmont's uh, Crimson Guard book. Oh man, I'm not doing then that. Then you read that and then you finish, you start up with chapter one here. That is unfair. Yeah, well, I mean, that's if you want to really read all of it chronologically, or at least in order of the way the books are. And then that's not even getting into the Borchelon books and all the other <laughs> Corbel Brooch, yeah, Bauchelain exactly. and Corbel Brooch. Yeah, sorry. I, lo I love those guys. They're <laughs> the best. They're the best. <laughs> but that's for later. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, have we reached the end? Uh, well, technically, chapter. we've reached the beginning, the end of the beginning, because this is the first chapter of book three. Yes. Chapter, chapter eight. Chapter eight, first book. All right. First chapter, book three. And that, that closes it down. It's nice and short. It still probably took longer than we thought it would, but that's all right. The next chapter is long. 32 pages, 33 pages. Yeah, but it's 30 pages of Erickson's. Yes. yes, exactly. Yes, and they're big pages with little print. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode. Um, we are going to get right on to reading and working on the next episode. Absolutely, can't wait. Yeah, me either. What about you, Yule? I am so excited for it. 
He's already reading. That's yeah. the thing. He's not really telling it's us. Like, while you guys were talking about something, I don't know what you're talking about. I already started reading the next chapter. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for joining us, and we will see you in the next chapter. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>